okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. Time to open the mind of humanity. In this episode, I would like to look at how communication and the ability for our species to communicate is a gift. It's an advantage. It's a rare opportunity. <clears throat> it's an opportunity where on one side there is suffering, but on the other side there is reward. That reward is actually how much we go through the suffering without being influenced by it. You know, when, when thinking about the mind as something that can be open, I made some notes and I thought about, okay, let's say the mind is like a, you know, like a valve, okay? And let's say that the mind is open. So I thought of at wondering about it from three different senses of time. First of all, a past question. If the mind is open, how has the mind opened? That is the past question I want to look into. Then there's the present question, how is it open now? You know, that means if you have a mind which its opening is suggesting the activation of intelligence, so it's kind of like, how is it open? How, are you, uh, how is your intelligence happening right now? And then the future question, how can we, if the mind is assumed in the present to be closed, how can you open it? Or if the mind is assumed to be open now, how can we keep it open? That is the future question. Now, the concept of a mind is a very unique one. It's one of the most fascinating words uh, ever created, the mind. It is pointing to what is being us uh, before we have the potential to do anything in accordance to the stimulus of the environment. You see, there is... There is a presence of attention. In this presence of attention, based on the stimulus, based on what happens in the environment, uh, the mind gets programmed. The mind has information to respond off. I would consider that the mind is not an object. It is what separates an object uh, from... <clears throat> Uh, empty uh, from from the absence of intelligence you know we look at human beings we say they have minds we look at for example I don't know a cup of coffee and we're like look at this mindless cup of cup of coffee <laughs> I'm gonna read for you how common language has attempted to define the mind. So guys, check this out. This is the way the world has defined mind. 
the element of a person that enables them to be aware of the world and their experiences, to think and to feel, the faculty of consciousness and thought. And it's, we've defined it as a noun here. So that could be, that could be a very profound uh, philosophical error that we have defined the mind the same way we have tried to name an object. The mind could be a process. <clears throat> so keeping the mind open or a time to open the mind of humanity means that human beings uh, are ready to become aware beyond ideological uh, symbols. That means we have dwelled enough as an object, as a subject. This doesn't mean we should stop being objects and subjects, but it means that if we're aware of more, then we can be more. The second definition the dictionary has for us for what a mind is, a person's ability to think and reason. Uh, the intellect, a person's memory, a particular way of thinking, influenced by a person's professional environment, a person identified with their intellectual faculties, the third definition, a person's attention. So you see, guys, <clears throat> and here, the mind even has, we have it in the sense of a verb, but not in the philosophical way. You know, be distressed, annoyed. Okay, guys, interesting comment in the chat section. Being human says you can never understand this. You can only experience this in terms of your past experience. This is outside the realm of experience. The natural state is a causal. It just happens. No, 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 no. You can definitely experience. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I, I, like, I know what you're saying. You're saying that it's prior to experience. Uh, prior to experience, there's no content. But it doesn't mean intelligence is only content-based. You know, you say no communication is possible and none necessary. The only thing that is real to you is the way you're functioning. It is an act of futility to relate my description to the way you're functioning. When you stop all this comparison, what is there in your natural state? Then you will not listen to anybody. Good to see you again, man. Okay, being human, uh, let me tell you, man, you can be as empty as you like, my friend. <laughs> you can be as empty as as supremely as if you are a human being your mind has been so open there's nothing close to you that means you might be a person who climbs the tree and you're so in oneness with with the moment you know you're uh, that it's like who's climbing who you know who's climbing the tree is the tree climbing you so 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 what i'm trying to tell you being human is that i understand you are a keen sharp mind sharp eagle but let me tell you an eagle is not meant to just be the sky. An eagle may fly from a branch, go to the most selfless states of being, look at the whole sky from absence, from emptiness, look at the whole forest from, from the height in the sky, but it doesn't mean you can stay there. I will tell you the reason is, is because there is no purpose. There is no individual purpose to nullification of your personality. You, any person who goes towards a sort of experiential oneness that nullifies the reason for them to be an individual, it, you can do it. But it's as if there was a pen in your hand and you threw it away because you felt writing was an illusion. You know what I mean? <laughs> now, Mr. Within is saying, don't be so keen to get rid of a world that you think is an illusion. Maybe the thought of it being an illusion is the illusion. But thanks for sharing, being human. Keep the comments coming. Anyways, guys, back to this idea, of course, the mind is not an object. The fact that we're trying to even speak about it, that was my whole point, that when I was reading the, what the dictionary had to say about this, you know, the dictionary is saying it as, it's like your attention. It's the element of a person that enables them to be aware of the world. So we are feeling we need to have minds before we can experience self in a world, regardless of how much validity there is of just a purely objective origin or invalidity in regards to there being bigger mysteries. You see, we got to see that it's an attempt. <clears throat> There's no there. All things must be described in the physical and physiological. Oh, oh. So being human, you better not read the definition of emptiness. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, I went to look for the definition of emptiness, but I couldn't find any. <laughs> I feel there's different kinds of people on this planet. 
there is people who want to leave the place they are, and there are people who want to stay where they are. We have to have an effort to share our inner realms. There's too much unknown. That means any, any, any sort of ideology that nullifies the need to ask a question is an ideological system that doesn't need the answer. You know, this is why when you have a philosophical conversation with an incredi incredibly religious person or an incredibly um, <coughs> materialist uh, type of person, you begin to see they are lost to the extreme. They are possessed by the extreme. You know, there's this saying that says, um, uh, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche says it, he says, the person fighting monsters has to be careful not to become a monster in the process. You know, and that you stare into the abyss long enough, the, st the abyss stares back into you. And so I was like, how hilarious. The religious person is, the immaterialist is fighting the materialist, and the materialist is fighting the immaterialist, yet not realizing they are the, each other's codependent definition. So you see, when we don't fear language, we will not fear exploration of our minds. But if we fear language, if we feel uh, this language is more true than that language, if the language war still uh, continue, we cannot truly open this a collective gift that communication is. You see, it is true when we come to speak about other dimensions, of course, the moment we fathom the possibility that there is more rooms in this universe, that we are just in one room of a mansion, you know, and we're like, yeah, this is it, you know, it's like, no. There are some who ask the host to see if they can see the heavens behind their eyes. You see, it's energy. It's energy and image. If I was to say, what is human life? I would say, sure, I'll grant the objective component uh, uh, of, 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 a, of a physical body projecting a mind. <clears throat> Me personally, I'm more on Rene, du Rene Descartes' side. I, I feel that uh, um, the mind is being defined from a place that actually no definition can be gev given because it is, it is too dynamic. So what does that mean? That means when I come to define my own intelligence, even if I was to look in the mirror of my mind, I would notice that this intelligence is event-oriented. It is event-orchestrated. You know what it is? It's as if like you can see how you're an individual and living your life, but then you can have this mystical angle where you see you are actually the life of yourselves. Do you know, so, so, so what the fascinating thing is, even though there is the appearance, there is the positioning of a physical reality, which I'm just, I'm banging on the table right now. You know, there, there is this physical realm. But the thing is that this physical realm doesn't just remain the physical realm in our experience. It echoes into our inner realms, where, which appear as an additional room. Your imagination, you can go try it, go sit beside someone, imagine something and be like, hey, did, I say, did, you, did you think of something? You know, you'll see that you, there is a room. There is a room, every person's mind is like a room and they can choose based on trust to open it. The yogis uh, <coughs> would say that uh, there's only one thing, there's o sorry, there's only two things you can do in this life. Woo, big statement. Only two things? And people would say, Yogi, what, what do you mean, Yogi? You know, what do you mean, old sage? What do you mean there's only two things you can do in a world so big? And the Yogi was, these two things are the precursor to any activity. And what are those two things? You either trust phenomena or you don't. If you don't trust phenomena, you can't progress. If you don't trust your ability behind a car, you shouldn't drive. If you have a single doubt of your own ability, you shouldn't drive. But if you have a clarity, if you feel like uh, you're, you're willing to be the life of the moment, then drive. You see, when we look at it from a past sense, how, how is the mind open, 
I wondered about evolution, and I'm like, yo, evolution's doing something weird. <clears throat> and you know what evolution is doing? Evolution has been the eternal urge for an objective creature to continue subjectively. It's fascinating. Sometimes I feel like genetical memory is like a unique energy where sometimes it gives you the potential certain moments in life you see how things can happen and sometimes things in life just happen and then you become aware of it. So there has been times I have seen a door slowly, the wind could just move the door, move the door, bah! The door went like insane, you know? <laughs> it's like looking at your door, keep it down door! <laughs> <clears throat> the wind slammed the door shut. You know, it's not just people who slam doors, you know. The, winds, uh, the wind, uh, and I saw the door as it was about to close. I saw the event before it took place. And there's been situations where it's the opposite. It's like you're not even looking, pa, the door closes and you're like, what was that? You know, and you're like, you see, you know, the, wing is, the wind is closing doors, you know. <laughs> And opening them, you know, imagine. You're like, is the wind turning my doorknob right now? <laughs> <clears throat> so that's the thing I'm trying to say. That um, when we look at how the mind is opened, when we look at evolution, we realize whatever the process is, you can explain it however you like. You can be the, the most elegant, the most excellent evolutionary biologist, and I would agree with you, agree with you, but I'm telling you, how did it be, how is it a subject to itself now? The mystery, the mystery, what does that mean? That means I feel all branches of knowledge are making a conclusion of a specific unknown event. I'm telling you, there is a specific unknown event, something that took place where our minds really opened. Now, I have thought about it in so many ways. I've thought about it. Could it be and in, in, in it could the self be higher dimensional than the world, or is the world more multidimensional than the self? And both both views are fascinating and at the same time terrifying. Because if we are singular and the world is multidimensional, that means whatever we thought, let's say we index, like let's say you're a scientist and there weren't any black holes and we somehow could index the edge of the universe, you would see there would still be other universes. So in incredibly um, fascinating that the world is, and imagine we even think of there being entropy between a multidimensional relationship. Do you know? That means even parallel dimensions are stretching and they're influencing each other. <clears throat> that means it's like, what is keeping us from saying that dark matter and dark energy, those forces too dark to see their influence poetically, we can say that they are forces of another realm. You see, the mind dictates. You see, when you look at uh, the intelligence of the human being, it's expression, expression and reception, honestly. You, you receive experientially, and you can uh, express experientially. You could move as, as the reality of your whole moment, or you can move as a relationship of a part of content in it, you know? Okay, okay, so being human says call it consciousness, yet consciousness is unknown to the individual because any description you give is merely some knowledge passed on to you. <clears throat> Very interesting point being human, you, you are making a point that Hegel made to René Descartes. So being human, I, I just read your comment in the chat section, what you are saying is what Hegel told René Descartes. René Descartes concluded, that when he says, I think, therefore I am, people misinterpret, believe it or not, modern society has to some degree misinterpreted what René Descartes meant. René Descartes meant that his strategy was that this dude was doubting everything. He's like, he's doubting everything. He's like, I'm doubting you and you and you and you and you. You know, every, every element to his experience, René Descartes began doubting. Now, he reached a conclusion that if he doubts the doubter, what does it mean to doubt? So you can't doubt the doubter. 
That was what Rene Descartes said, being human. But check this out. Hegel came and said, Rene Descartes, the only reason you think you're an isolated thinking subject is because there's the other side, that you have actually been a social creature and there's been too many influences from epigenetics to just render consciousness as a natural phenomenon anymore. Do you see? So Hegel, Hegel kind of like uh, challenged Rene Descartes' isolated thinking subject, really. And so here, being human, you say call it consciousness, yet consciousness is unknown to the individual because any description you give it is merely some knowledge passed on to you. It is true, but who says I'm giving it a description when it's an experience? Do you need to describe for yourself when you're riding a horse? Imagine you're riding a horse. Okay? Do you need to describe horse riding to yourself? Do you need to believe or disbelieve horse riding? No. It's an experience. When it becomes an actual event, it surpasses any sort of subjective uh, articulation of the phenomena. Do you know? That means there, there were certain opinions I had on metaphysics that only through my experience, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa wrong view. And then I suddenly readjusted. You know? There was someone who, I, I don't remember who it was, but there was the distinction between consciousness and awareness. Awareness was attention unconditional. Consciousness was attention that had, the, had to have the conditions of an individual first. So you cannot be conscious if there's no form, but you can be aware if there is no form. So the word I think you want to use being human is awareness. Consciousness is, it, there's a condition to it because it, there's an individual. So, being human says interpretation is based on perception, therefore all, interpreta all interpretation is unique, therefore you can never share an experience beyond knowledge. You cannot share an inner, inner realm experience and you, it's not that you can share it because the experience is, has happened. No, it's like you can say no person after the event has passed can ever explain or reinterpret that event with the same intensity that it occurred. Do you know? That means everything is lost to communication when tomorrow we are a new self. So I don't know how people have beliefs when you are changing every day. I don't know why there's wars caused by belief when everybody's sense of self is changing. You even celebrate this change of sense of self as your birthday. So people are celebrating birthdays, but they, they are believing the same things as, as before. Do you know? So I'm telling you, there's this whole, de uh, whole deal going on with how language can, be, uh, it, it, it can become, uh, 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 if you use it as a technology, it's efficient. If you think you are language, it's inefficient. You know, and I'm, I, I have talked to so many, not so many, but I could tell you like enough people to know what happens when you begin to speak about the invisible. You know what happens? People's fingers point at the ego. <laughs> That's why I created the language threshold, the term, the language threshold, you know. So guys, back to the topic. So how is the mind opened? We can say unknown event. You know, something made the animal not want to be an animal anymore. And then we go, <laughs> then we go to the present where we have completely transformed. We have left the natural ecosystem that used to be the def defining of our mind. You know, that means think about it before homes, before internet, before streets, before people even wore clothing. Like, what was the meaning of life? What was the person's imagination before language and whatnot? You see, it was the environment's life. Our life was the ecosystem. 
There is a non-duality to the mind that trusts the environment. Because we stepped about outside of a natural environment, there was an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage was that we individualized. We were like, all right, we're going we're gonna to just step out of this jungle that's defining all our instincts and keeping us in these uh, loop patterns of savageness. And let's build a nice civilization. Let's see what we can do. Now, check this out. The moment we entered the concrete jungle was the first time in history, you can say, that man no longer depended on the environment. His environment's health depended on him. So we went from the world being in the driver's seat, moving the self, to now suddenly the self is in the driver's seat, you know, moving the world. Now, mysticism, for those people who've, who, are, who their self is in the driver's seat, they're individuals first and then considering the collective, mysticism comes and tells them, hey buddy, maybe your individuality is a hat you should take off. The person takes off the individualism and feels this bliss of no responsibility because when you're not an ideological self, how can you respond to anything? What are you even to respond to anything? You know? So you see, it, it's a nullification of the individual. So I was, there was a time where, of course, the poetry of Rumi, the, the Sufis, you know, <clears throat> uh, it, even I was introduced to it to, through Tibetan Buddhism, the teachings of Guru Padma Sambhava. These were, these were ideas that made me realize this world's algorithm to the higher dimensions is not some conceptual justification that desire is okay or not. It is a behavior with a symbiosis with the rhythms of the natural world. That means for me, when a human being needs help and a human being doesn't help that human being, it is literally e equal to a human being cutting down a tree, cutting down an event orchestrated mind. This is why children, they can get so, 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 they can feel so rejected by the world. Do you know? Because the world pushes them in a way where they don't even know how to process it. This is why I think whoever teaches the yin yang symbol to their child is uh, you've you've helped that child, you've made that child realize whatever. Don't fear anything. You will go to the depths of chaos. You'll still see the order cannot die. You will go to the depths of order, and you will see the chaos will not die. And then you become aware of the non-dual mind, which is your presence before you were a personality, for you were a presence before you were a personality, before you learned language, before the, uh, the barks of dogma changed us all, scared us all into a thought. Trust me, in my youth, I'm no stranger. Like, I, I haven't had pets, but um, in my youth, I've seen wild dogs. Do you know? Just there, we had this cottage in Iran. I was like, I don't know, maybe I was like 14 or something, and I could see like there was like, uh, there there is wilderness, there is intensity in this life, you know. <clears throat> and that intensity, you really can't do anything. You got to stare it in the face and be like, oh, okay, intensity. You show your face. I want to show my face. <laughs> you don't know, guys. Uh, I somebody, if somebody asked. Mr. Within, how do you fight chaos? I would say only one weapon is strong enough, and that weapon is not an order, is a mirror. That means in my inner realms, I would say I have shielded myself through the realization of the self-reflective nature of my mind. You see, an activity is energy. Energy is being governed by the most you can say highest frequency mind. That means the mind that is uh, aware. So I could tell you like there's a difference between someone who sees more information in a game than someone who doesn't. Do you know when you have more information, you have preparation for unknown dimensions that don't, are not necessarily you can expect. You know? So, here's the thing. 
how is the mind open the past so this that's the subjective evolution uh, something sparked it I feel I have my own theory on it others have theirs <clears throat> my theory is that um, light carries geometrical patterns that sculpt the potential of life on intelligent particles that are just uh, gravitated as, as our planet that means the way the planet is designed I wouldn't be surprised if till the end of time new 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 species and different species keep popping out you know if, if we don't mess up the surface of the planet this planet is made of endlessly potential particles that once <clears throat> they interact with light reality become uh, uh, enters the eyes so we go to how is it open how is it open that means how would we consider the intelligence like right now if you want to wonder if your mind is open or not in the present okay because I've added a certain time dimension to this I would say in the present your mind is open if you can see as Henry David Thoreau says it's not like it's not what you're looking at that matters it's what you see that seeing means that the dishonest archetypes also give you feedback when sensory perception enters them like fuel, but, but your honest archetype is actually your alertness. <clears throat> because when, when a human being wants to solve a problem or figure something out, they are not dishonest. You see, dishonesty has been... Uh, the reason it lingers is because it's a comparative advantage. That means people knew that the less information their competitors had, the more they would be the top dog or something like that. But let me tell you, we're reaching a point where individual survival tactics are no longer enough. That means we got to understand the value of community. You see, even the cells in your body, smaller cells, they become complex tissue smaller biological cells so what does that mean that means humanity's efficiency let us is consider that uh, in our future we are a collective rhythm of a uh, being you know I have noticed that there is, like I have this theory, which, I don't know, some, some schools of thought <clears throat> in, for example, uh, um, okay, here's the thing, in Qigong, <clears throat> Qigong is something very important, I think all, every person, I think they should teach Qigong in schools, but I don't know. In Qigong, the human being is looking at the biological body and they are not limiting it to a thought. They want to experientially manage their intelligence. That means it's not per se a belief system. It's more like you want to, you're an energetic being. You want to handle the energy, not conceptually or behaviorally, but you want to just experience yourself as energy. You know, let's say human be the hu human consciousness is conscious energy. There will come a time, guys, where the educational system in the future will ask more questions from the child than give answers. It will give the child more questions, and that's a successful educational system. <clears throat> because the question doesn't shape, define you, it challenges you. The answer, answers usually define. This is why when someone answers a person's question, if they don't like the answer, it's because they don't want to be defined by that view.
guys, I'm just trying to say that uh, right now <clears throat> we are suffering is because most people are under the impression that their desires are met if they know something. But I'm telling you, in this life, whatever, you can get as many certifications on your wall, you realize it's too big to know uh, completely. So all certification in, in the educational system is specifics. Because the general becomes such a massive problem where you don't need one mind to solve it. This was something I understood that I was happy that there was a sort of uh, opening up to the audience these ideas because some problems are not solved by one human being. It's impossible. Literally the problem is too big that one human being is not enough of an energetic output to even do much. You know, <clears throat> I, I feel that the future of our species is more closer to an energetic experience where in Qigong there, the energy of your body was like a river. Okay, so imagine like a, this circle of riv this circle of energy uh, in your body. Okay, by every inhale, exhale, as if energy is moving around in your body. You know, most people feel they are, they move energy, but let me tell you, energy is moving before you move. <laughs> <coughs> energy is busier than you. <laughs> so you see. This, and, and so in Qigong, they considered that blocks of the person's health and vitality were um, caused by, um, like there were certain blockades. Imagine building a dam on suddenly throwing like a giant log in the middle of the river. It makes the water go to the outskirts. It ruins the flow of energy in the human body. Okay? So that's the qi, that's pretty much any Tai Chi and Qigong you see, it, it has to do with a sort of balance, but the balance is coming from a release of the inner realms, of the outer realms, because energy has its own presence. You see, when here's the thing, it's like, why don't people talk to statues? Why don't materialists just talk to statues? You know? Why don't they consider it? it's like yeah that's 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 it's like that's equivalently as material as you why don't you talk to a statue because the faculty of reception is much more it's like the effect of what has been expressed it's as if regardless of if the cause was physical or not the effect is not physical so we are like this physical process that on the other side of its other side of the coin is like an invisible field and this invisible field has been tried we poets have tried to penetrate the veils of the unconscious philosophers even artists uh, writers every human being that has looked at this world and has said what other story dwells in the abyss you know that has been the pursuit of knowledge. You know, after a point, knowledge, like for me, it was very language-oriented. Then it became image-oriented when I understood what language's role is. You see, after some point, we as creatures looked at stuff and we named it. Just like how we name ourselves and we treat ourselves as individual and we're like that person and this person. But really, the mind is a multidimensional phenomena. What does that mean? That means in certain states, you feel everything is singular. In certain states, you feel everything can be void. You, in certain states, you feel things can be dualistic. Things can be, things come in pairs, like there's a good side and a bad side to life. Then you can also go even beyond duality. This is for those really uh, uh, futurist moralists. Uh, and this is when their morality is defined by the infinite potential of man. That means you can judge yourself as being a good person, as a bad person, or you can judge yourself as a, having an infinite potential to be good, infinite potential to be bad. The tides of history change. You see, it's like back in the day, like <clears throat> imagine someone with a top hat comes comes time travels to 2020 they go to a busy market you know and then the owner of let's say a store comes out to that uh, let's say British time traveler with the top hat to kick your hat off man you know this is stop playing games stop being silly do you know and that person with the top hat would be like the future is in normal so to the past tell me what is normal when has the future to the past been normal 
That means the, the, the anomaly is the sign of the future. The strange ones in the world, you are ahead. You are so ahead of time, you're actually ahead of the concept of time. <laughs> <clears throat> Somebody once asked Plato, is like, hey, Plato, I'm, I, I got to run. What time is it? You know, you got a sundial or something. And Plato looked at the man and he said, my good man, time is the moving image of eternity. <laughs> Like that's the best answer to give when you don't know what time it is and people ask you what time what time it is. Yeah. <laughs> you look at your clock and you're like, yeah, it's it's just eternity, man. I don't know what to tell you. We're in a rock in the middle of nowhere. Language is our own design, you know. It, we opened our eyes on this rock, we named the rock and now we think our names are us. You know? That's honestly what's going on. We have separated from nature to discover our own nature, which made sense. We saw what the potential was. Now we got to look at the potential again. That means it's impossible to look at life or have a past without being able to have a potential future. The design of your past is the potential of the future. Man, th these four dimensions, these f there's four experiences, and every person gets a different range and percentage of these. Um, but I feel every person gets to experience them, but in different ways. <clears throat> if somebody tells you, hey, when you're sleeping at night, when you're in deep sleep, do you have problems? Do you have pain when you're sleeping? Do you have suffering? Do you have joy? Is there a heaven and hell when you're in deep sleep? You see, no. It's absence. That means absence is one also uh, 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 as fascinating as a random black hole in outer space. My theories on a black hole I uh, like I wrote to give a talk on it, but um, I I I suddenly envisioned the concept of the black hole in a totally different way, guys. You can say this is Mr. Within's uh, bowling pocket black hole theory. <laughs> now that's exactly my point. That what appears to us perhaps as a black hole on a plane is actually we are inside one of the holes of a bowling ball and there could be endless holes in this bowling ball so I feel we are inside a simulation now when I say inside it doesn't mean we are the simulation we are inside it though just because you go visit your uh, let's say you're invited to a party and you go attend that party at that person's address, it doesn't mean you live in their address. It means that after you 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 step out of you uh, of that which um, was never you, if I can. Wanting to know reasons, knocking on a door. The door opens. I have been knocking from the inside. <sighs> okay, guys, this is ridiculous. This is getting disconnected. Um, so anyways, I'll bring my attention to the tree branch of the chat section. So we... Akai says, that's why I can't... Acknowledge time anymore, Lowell. It's been smooth. Lobo says, I'm curious as to what you have to say about money in relation to everything you are speaking about. Well, money is part of the concrete jungle's ecosystem. It is an incredibly crucial that there is dimensions of this life that require an animalistic effort of man. So I would say money is something where 
<clears throat> it's an occupation it, it's occupying the attention of the human being um, in good and bad ways so if you want to make make the civilization interstellar and you want technology to evolve in civilization so you need a capitalistic sort of competitive oriented kind of uh, environment you know it's like the more capital you have the more power you have uh, to move and build so for example I'm really inspired by Elon Musk what he's doing you know and I could totally see that in this time money is, a, is of course a factor but if you're asking about how money what I feel is going to happen to the concept of money in the future I feel civilization is going to uh, move hopefully uh, towards a skill a skill exchange system you see right now um, reality kind of appears like a video game where in front of your eyes you are in the same objective world as all everybody's character in the conscious waking state but behind your eyes it's as if the inner realms and this sort of unknownness to the inner realms this unknown awareness to the screen of life okay so I would say Lobo as a response to you in the chat section money is energy in for now the healthiest way for you to look at money it's energy It honestly is energy the more money you have and it's also based on the location you live right that means if you're living in the mountains and you're like a simple farmer and you're living a very simple and gentle life well of course I mean sure maybe money you go to, you go like maybe three times a year to, and sell sell your harvest or something but you see money is not a center of your life but if you were a Wall Street guy then it's like you're trying to break some code so money actually is the center of your life and that's the thing because when you know what someone wants they can be easily manipulated so if you see that the civilization wants money then money can very simply manipulate them they, the person will uh, they will their ethical moral uh, character will be bypassed by the energy that they could get from money you know like the, you can say money energizes the ego <laughs> you know it's like <clears throat> you know just like how uh, certain people you know wear shiny chains around their neck it's also like the ego also wears money around its neck that means money is being used as this is hilarious you might not believe it but by most people as a cosmetic item and not just for women just the hu most human beings they are using money to express their individualism or just live their individual life it, it's like the energy money is like uh, is like water you know if you don't have it you'll go thirsty if you have a you, you know have it you won't go thirsty do you know but when that thirst comes when that when you see the chaos of how how low life can descend especially in 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 the system we have i mean uh i've i've thought about capitalism and in what ways it will update or evolve but i'm going to keep that for another talk Pr pretty much i would say lobo m the before money do you know how pe what 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 was there before money it was a bartering system they would trade some dude would be like hey man i have a bear pelt you know and you have like a shovel want to trade and they'd be like yeah it's like it was like that was the earliest kind of you could say evolution towards what is uh, giving money and taking money now do you know it was items people were trading items then they found a way to simplify it you know you didn't have to carry your bear pelt you know you could just carry a bunch of coins instead so it was an efficient system of 
um, helping, you know, like it was necessary for epigenetics. That means we had to. It's like the concept of money, believe it or not, is, is, the, uh, is similar to the concept of God in the sense that Voltaire says if, the, if there was no concept of God, it would be necessary to create it. Now, Voltaire was an atheist, a very educated atheist saying this. Why did he say that? Because he could see that regardless of if we think an idea is valid or invalid, due to the event uh, basis and orchestration of how history unfolds, there is requirements based on the users. For me, the issue is not even the money. Because you can, because, let me tell you, I remember seeing this Facebook meme, <coughs> Um, that means this thing about money being good and evil, it's, it's an object. It's an object. You really think like a, like a coffee cup can be good and evil? Now you think a coin? It's what the person does with the tool in their hand that suggests what kind of user they are. So you can say there's no such thing as good and bad people. We have just human beings where their attention is open to let the simulation arise efficiently and uh, inefficiently. Inefficient is violence. When you see an angry and violent person, that's a person who is locked in their inner realms. You kind of feel bad for them. You're like, look at this guy, leashed to his past. Sad. It's sad to watch. You know? <clears throat> that means it, it, it's as if it's like, but there is some times where I'm not talking about in regards to extreme situations because anger is energy. Anger can be like a hammer as well. So, you know, it's like when Thor sees there's, uh, he's outnumbered, he brings out the hammer, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I'm telling you, if we were to think just like how it went from uh, we us changing, I oh, I was saying this, this thing to you, that on Facebook there was this meme, this picture, and it showed planet Earth from an astronaut's viewpoint, this ball, like green, blue, uh, white ball, green, blue, white, brown ball, you know, and as... <clears throat> Um, as it showed that planet from outer space, on top of it, somebody had wrote trillions of dollars in debt. A pebble in a light beam is trillions of dollars in debt. Do you see? So for me, it's something very fascinating that the efforts of our ancestors has developed a system uh, where you can say it's changing slower than the natural world. That means if you really want to know, like, I think it's going to terrify. Like, imagine... I'm just saying there's nothing wrong with money. It's just the story, the characters in the story we think we are. Money is money is like money is like uh energy. It it money is um energy. You can use your energy to do good things, you can use your energy to do bad things. You can break something, you can build something. You can use the money to make a hospital and save people in a village, or you can use that money not to make a hospital or go and destroy a hospital. Like You know what I mean? Like, so I'm telling you, it's about utility. It's about usage. It's, a, it's, it's time for human beings to kind of see the relationship in the moment. Okay, I am the user of the technology, which is the phenomenological landscape that is being instantly processed by whatever intelligence is my eyes are being, you know? I would say if you think about if you think about money um, before yourself, you are possessed by the past. If you think about yourself before money, you can be conscious of money. You won't lose yourself. Um, you know, it, it's like a person. Here's the thing: it, it feels to me like most people get rich. And it's like you, they suddenly have this incredible energy and excitement. And so they want to just dance. But it's like you don't have to express that energy. You know, you can uh, focus it. You know, there's, uh, there's some people who just kick, you know, they don't know how to kick. They just kick. And there's the martial artist that has aimed and sees his kick even before it happens. So, so I'm telling you, there's different levels of attention to the phenomenon. And the nature of the character. That means if you're if you're telling yourself the story, I'm this poor bastard and I need to get rich. Well, <laughs> of course, money is like your god at that point. 
Money is the only thing your attention wants to be on. But if you think of it this way, that I'm part of an evolutionary civilization, I'm part of the system, and let me look at the system, and then look at myself, then look at the system again, then look at myself, and then see what is a win-win situation for the collective self and the individual self. And then I feel that is way more open to being monetized when, when there is a dimension of giving, do you know? Honestly. Like, where else can you give? Where else can you share? What, in the afterlife we're going to have good conversations about life? It's only now. When people forget the significance of the moment, it's easy for them to nullify through abstraction. For me, it's, it's more like, I was like, wait a minute, what is this thing I'm calling knowledge? And it became a landscape of design. Because honestly, it's how someone uses it. Like you can see someone play an instrument and you're like, buddy, maybe, maybe play alone. You know? <laughs> and then you see, you see some people play an instrument and you're like, thank you for uh, blessing us with the light of your music. You know? <laughs> I'll tell you this though. Persistence and attention and the alchemy of experience with existence is a totally different thing. That means... There is different levels of thinking about money. But anyways, um, interesting question, Lobo, but um, I'm gonna, I'm, I think I should pile it back to the talk. <sighs> but you can say when our mind opens, it will transform what even money means. Like, I was thinking about even the concept of money if we connected all our heads to one computer. I was like, why would a collective being need money? Why would uh, energy that's not fragmented need purpose, individual purpose? You see, it, 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 it's like the moment we're no longer individuals, not only money is nullified, but every other concept relevant to the individual. So we have to pr protect our natural biological evolution as a pillar of civilization. Do you see? You know, when nature cares for itself, it becomes alive. Anything you don't care about, it's like you're disimbuing life. You're taking away life. Anything you care about, you give it life. So you can, they, you can say the same way uh, you water a plant. If, if, if a mind wants to water another mind, you just care. You can just see that singular dimension is very crucial. You see, because it, it, it tends to be the case that if the individual is rejected by civilization, that's the main reason they will go against it, because it's very hard to, to admit to yourself that you are wrong. It's always easier to say somebody else is wrong than seeing yourself to be wrong. Always. You know? You ask someone, what's your opinion on yourself? The person may not say much. You ask them, what's your opinion on that guy? And the, blah, 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 the person just starts, you know, gapping away. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go to the future tense of the question. How can we keep? So the answer to the present is how is the mind open? It is open unconditionally due to the nature of awareness to self. That means it's like you wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute, was mind here first or body? If your mind has been objectified or subjectified, you will feel body is here first. If your mind is an experience that is one instantaneous event of phenomenology that's supremely being, then in that sense, you don't, you don't play that much ideologically with the world. You don't try to sculpt the world's shape anymore. So there's some people listening to my talks and they're just all laughing. You know why? Because they feel nothingness is speaking. But it's not nothingness. It's just not a thing. A person, I don't believe you should think of money. You should just try to see what's here. That means uh, if, if, if everybody goes towards 
uh, and here's the thing. Like I was thinking about what is a strategy. Oh man, we're going back into money. Let me see. Let's see how we can bring the talk out of. Uh, <laughs> it's like this wouldn't be a bad time. Maybe when I, it's like, hey, you want to know more about money? It's like join my Patreon. <laughs> I'm joking, guys. Patreon is a community only for the honest. <laughs> that means if you honestly care, join it. If you don't, like, don't. Anything that occupies the attention of the person is can be said to be what the action of worshipping was. So you can say money is just an object and narrative in the attention of the person. Like I'm pretty sure someone metaphysical, they, they, it's like asking someone who thinks they're an eternal being, what is money? It's like, buddy, it's just you're playing with the grass on the park, you know, there's so much more. <laughs> So it depends. I mean, hu human psychology opens up in different ways. Psychologists are even saying something very next level. They're saying that because the brain hemisphere can, it has been, we've, we've kind of classified the left brain hemisphere and the right hemisphere to be different. So the, some psychologists are like, yo, 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 the brain is uh, arising in two ways while simultaneously one. So the same way you have two eyes that uh, see this C1 view, it's as if you have two abstract senses of self that are being the same moment. Do you know? And these abstract senses of self is the echo of the dualistic mind behind the eyes of man. Which pretty much Carl Jung and philosophers are all on top of that. Philosophers are like, yeah, man, let's open the door of nothingness. <laughs> let's open the door of emptiness to see what's behind emptiness. Like that's when you know you have the soul of a philosopher, when you want to see what's behind emptiness. Like, <laughs> it's like, how do, you, how do you spend your evenings? Nothing, man. I just look at the sky wondering if its edge is behind my eyes. Guys, any idea that is occupied in your attention, the algorithm to <clears throat> break free from the past is to wonder who you were before that idea was real to you. That's it. Who were you before that thought? And that's the truth, uh, inner character strength comes from that. Comes from not fearing in your honesty who you will be. Because honestly, you have one life to display. I mean, really, like, I could sit here and give these talks and so many people can come and say comments, don't give the talk, give the talk, don't give the talk. And I'll be like, listen, this binary program goes on forever. I'm not joking. It's a system where we are a form in it, but we are a form in a jar of liquid. Where the jar, whatever way the jar shakes, we shake. So I, even though I sit here thinking about my free will, yeah, we're all going to be advanced communicators in the future. At the same time, I know that a natural event can wipe all dreams. So if we just depend on the linguistic, I feel we miss out on actually what's here. <clears throat> For me, guys, money is just a phase. Currency is a face. We're gonna when we realize we're minds, the narrative, the ethos of civilization 2.0 is gonna be way more brilliant than this fax machine civilization we have. You know, our civilization right now, like I saw, so even if there were aliens, if Fermi's paradox, Fermi, um, you can say was this philosopher who was like, where the hell are the aliens? Where are the aliens? It's like, what is this? Are we the only ones here? Like, did we, get, did we get to the party late? Or did we get to the party early? Like, what's going on? So that's Fermi's paradox. Now I'm saying it's kind of like, this is Mr. Within's view. I would be embarrassed if aliens land on Earth. I'm just going to cover my face. I mean, like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. You know, 
we're still killing each other. Like, imagine the alien clans, and it's like, all right, let's see if we should reunite with this peaceful species, human species. And we're like, hey, aliens, we're peaceful. Then the alien scans the whole world's events at once, and they're like, no, your history is fucked up. You know, we're not going <laughs> to... The aliens are just going to excuse my language, but the aliens are going to just fly away. They're going to be like, these guys are too wild. Like, what is this? We can't communicate with animals, you know? So that's the thing. The more less violent you are and the more that same energy of violence you use for advancing the communication of your species and sharing the inner realms, the more aliens are going to be like, I like what's going on here. I'm just saying this as a hypothetical consideration that really if we were looking, if all of us had jetpacks and we we're just looking at our planet, what would be the sign of it would be our intelligence would be how not just we are expressing the outer, but how the inner is being expressed to the awareness. <clears throat> so there's more to life than what meets the eye, including the eye of the mind. And the eye of the mind is not some esoteric rudeness towards the unknown. It is, it is, a, it is, it is a suggestion that when you are ready to see the singular, you're ready to remember yourself as an uh, empty field. The singular has only two exits. <clears throat> so the moment the human mind accesses a perception of ultimate singularity of phenomena, that means nothing means anything because everything is everything. So the two exits would be the void and the dual. And right now we exited into the dual. Most people at least. So in duality, all human psychology and knowledge is also oscillating between the singular and this through the singular you can only understand the void. That's why I call it only through the singular void or through the infinite void. That means if infinity is a precursor, pre precursor to a dualistic evolution that ascends, that's going in an ascending wave, I would say. That means the psychology of some human beings, like here's the thing, the more you fail, the more you feel an isolation. The more you succeed, the more you feel um, a collective rhythm. The healthiest human mind, because we're social creatures, and of course, uh, granted that some people are more mystically inclined. That means we have some people on this planet that they are comfortable with their silence, and we have some people who are not comfortable with silence. It's just they don't like it. You know? And the reason is, is because their life is defined by language. They still think they're a thought. So when you don't fear yourself as a thought, you actually get access to noticing that you, what your intelligence is, is like you are watching the film of your life and you're the main character. You're the main character in the film of your life. You are both the director and the actor. This is why I'm saying Hollywood should have all the directors start acting and all the actors start directing. Simon says, is camera the greatest invention? If you were history asking the question, of course. But if you were the future asking the question, it could be an illusion. It could have it could be Thor's hammer that actually like its handle wasn't smooth, so it made gave Thor's hand blisters, you know? <laughs> it's like what did these celestial dwarfs, you know, make in this in this furnace of a star, you know? That's actually where Thor's hammer comes from. I don't know if many people know this, but in Nordic mythology Thor's hammer was a gift from Loki. Loki did something messed up. Then, like as an apology, he went to these dwarves. Then he like set to two competing dwarves, these celestial dwarves, 
uh, like uh, he wanted to run. He's like the dude just was like a trickster, Loki. Like the dude just expressed himself through deception. <laughs> you know, poor Loki. You know. You know, it's like where does dishonesty get a god? It's like the Hulk slammed Loki to the walls. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, some, some human beings, maybe they learn through the chaos, but now the system doesn't need as much chaos because chaos is ancient. Chaos is our grandfather. But we're not chaos anymore. Yeah. So Loki gets a spear, gets a hair, a hair and this line of divine hair, and <clears throat> the dwarves craft these gifts. And Thor's hammer. So Odin gets a spear, Odin, uh, Thor's mother gets hair, and Thor gets the hammer. And so the, Loki comes back into the good graces of his family, you know, mythological family. <laughs> Honestly, I feel the civilization has just dwelled in utter silence and the fact that people are not sharing their inner realms is very strange. It's the suggestion of language worship. It's the symptom of a, of a system that is too defined by its first uh, instructions. You know what it is? It's like a child's conditioning is like how the world shouted at it. You know? And so the child has to realize the world was in error not the child. If you think you were an heir, anytime you entertain a victim mentality, I mean, it's true, you can, but you got to be like, wait a minute, that's the same time I could also not apply a, a victim mentality. So the inner realms are not like the physical. Thoughts come and go. As Chang Su, the Zen master says, beliefs are like leaves on a tree or something. Like they add throughout the seasons, the texture of how you have contained the world as a concept has changed. <sighs> And by the way, guys, treat the chat section as a School of Athens 2.0 kind of style where philosophical questions of the highest caliber are welcomed. So feel free to uh, feel like an ancient Greek philosopher in the chat section. <laughs> This opening of humanity's mind, I consider it that you can't just open a person's mind if they don't care for their objective dimensions. So you can say it's like any person interested in metaphysics, is the, the reasoning should be because they have been so interested in physics and they have gone to the edge of physics and they're like, okay, what else? I could say mysticism could be summed up into just this one phrase, what else is there? <laughs> this one phrase is one of the healthiest, this is one of the great questions of humanity, I'm going to declare it, why not? What else is there? You ask this, I think this, this question as an algorithm will liberate anyone. It wouldn't liberate you, but it will make you see more than the angle you see at first. I think uh, in, in my, I mean, of course, it started in my writings, then I talked about it, and the idea developed in my talks, and <clears throat> it was this idea of this, the multidimensional renaissance, where I was like, all right, we've had a renaissance before, what would the, other, the next renaissance look like? I, like, wondered about it, you know? I wondered about it. It's like, for me, that was an incredible time. It was a time where, of course, I wasn't alive then, but the way I imagined it was that there was something in the air that felt new and people were inspired by that they felt they were contributing to a new event and the Renaissance is became actually an incredible part of our history where human beings dared go beyond their limits you know and the, we that was a for me it was like a massive uh, inner realm collective evolution you know
Okay, so Daniel uh, says, have you ever studied any of the Kabbalistic or magical <laughs> traditions? I'm supplementing my meditation with it, but I'm not sure if it's something that will strengthen ego desire rather than transcend. You know what's funny? If you want to strengthen the ego, <laughs> if you want to strengthen the ego, the yogi would be like, not this man, don't do it. And if you want to... <laughs> If you want to transcend the ego, also the yogi would be like, not this man, you know, don't do it. Because the point is, um, you have to find, you have to treat yourself as an antenna, a known antenna in an unknown field, in an unknown world. And you have to find a way that you can trust your mind like a master musician trusts the instrument in their hand. And then you got to begin your search into really what the inner realms mean because it's a difference between you looking for something just cool because you're bored or you actually wondering okay I've noticed the edge of perception in my current experience now what can po potentially change from the edge of what is the known to me so what happens is when we get to the known it's the same edge as the unknown so the unknown is the other side of the coin so in regards to magical traditions, in regards to Kabbalistic thinking, I mean, to be honest, I probably need to, I don't know enough about Kabbalistic thought, but I feel I understand probably what it would say. I could totally see where it could head. So I could tell you, like, I, like I'm a designer that doesn't necessarily think in language, I think through like there's a geometrical component to how I perceive. <clears throat> so I would say magic was language like early human beings. Some of them knew how to use language as an advanced technology. Some of them didn't. Those who knew, knew how to use it as a technology, they used it to deceive because they could, simply said. But the issue was you can never hit cause something without causing without having it echo in your inner realms. So the moment you you hit someone, you're actually hitting yourself. It's impossible not to hit yourself without hitting someone. You can it's like impossible to fight and not get injured. You know, unless you run away or you endlessly maintain spacing like you see in certain boxing matches. You know. <laughs> So Daniel, I will tell you this, for me, I, I kind of got a bit sad because esotericism, modern esotericism or occultism appears to me as rudeness, like a childlike rudeness, you know, to the unknown. So for me, it's weird that if you really chase something in your inner realms, it's like noob, N-O-O-B. So I could say... Occult, occult, occultism, not that there was anything wrong, it's like a plant growing in the garden, it's a way of behavior, a way of idea, it's an ideological system, maybe, for some. But I'm telling you, this world, if there is 0, 0.00, uh, whatever amount of zeros you want, 1% chance it's multidimensional, it means you can't define the, outer, the, uh, the unknown from just one dimension. That's why I'm saying you're being rude in esoteric practice to kind of seeking the power of the invisible because the invisible will slap you. It will be like, you silly. You know, you can't even see yourself. You want me to give you power? You know, it's like the, the, it's going to be rude to the inner realms. So don't act. It's not, a, it's not a film. The inner realms is not a film. You're just an entity that has appeared like a candle. The biology is like wax. It melts and the light is the mind. The candle flame is the mind. Now, this candle flame shouldn't play in artificial simulations. It should wonder about how it is justifying the boundaries of its reality in a giant dynamic changing system. <clears throat> so, um, no, no, no. I mean, compassion, sure, but it's, it's, it's not that. Because you can say that there, uh, there is no identity in, in, in higher dimensions. Even Vedanta saw this. But Vedantic thought also engages this. There is no higher dimensions because there's no personality to receive. There is sight. 
sight is not sight your your eyes you may think it's just based on uh, like your biology but your awareness your mind sight is unconditional to this dimension you the body is like a motorcycle imagine some guy on a Harley Davidson just in the highway you know driving on the highway when the motorcycle doesn't have fuel it's not that the atoms get destroyed the atoms are the same atoms as the ancient stars do you see it's it's just like a layer of potential complexity breaks down into simplicity so the guy has to get off his motorcycle and you no longer own that motorcycle so imagine you in, in, in this is a sci-fi setting you're driving a motorcycle then you see there's a timer on the motorcycle when the timer ends it vanishes in thin air it was a rental imagine rental vehicles in the future they just vanish so if you're driving with a rental car that's past its time through advanced nanotechnology the car just becomes invisible and you're like where's my car you know <laughs> I'm just telling you, nature is, is, is that mind. That means all those things the esotericists or the occultists are trying to attain by thinking that their initiation to a specific way up the mountain is the only way up the mountain, trust me. It's like there's way more than the mountain. Plus, imagine you get up the mountain and you see you have wings. You imagine, imagine the dude just being like, I'm an individual, and for many years I will do individual uh, behavioral patterns to, for example, honor the unknown. Now, there's nothing wrong. You're free. You have freedom of speech and mind and vision. Uh, you have freedom of existence. You could do whatever you like here. But I'm just telling you, you got to realize that there, the ceremonial component to the outcome of the mind was a flaw, and Buddha. This was a conclusion made during Buddhist times. Buddha came and saw a lot of weird Brahmanic uh, ritualistic behavior back in the day. Some people were ascetics. They would just literally not eat and in, in the process of dying they thought they would see the true truth. The Buddha the Buddha uh, tried that path and he realized, oh my god, I'm dying and this is not the truth. How could dying be the truth of life? You know what I mean? It's the end of it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth of it, you know? So, that's what I'm, what I'm telling you, that it, the Buddha suddenly, like miraculously, this girl... Sorry guys, I'm, it's a hot day, just hold on.
Okay, guys, I, I had to handle something. Uh, okay, let's get back to it. So, yeah, the, the Buddha went towards the ascetic path. He's like, yeah, these guys are fools. What are they doing? Not, eat, not like, trying to kill themselves to see the truth. That makes no sense, you know? And then he saw even some people who were hanging upside down from the tree. And Buddha's like, what are you guys doing? And they were like, hey, man, get out of here. This is our way. We, this is our path to truth. Like, this is how we see God, you know? And Buddha looks at him. I'm not joking, Buddha. This is a story, a relevant story to Buddha. He says, uh, Buddha looks at him and says, you guys are not, this is no path to truth. You guys are acting like bats. He sees there was a lot of opening of the early imagination of human beings towards certain ways that they felt that they could also access a sort of ultimatum to their life. Right? So the Buddha went on all these paths. Then this dude was like, enough, you know. <laughs> He got he got probably tired and he sat down by a tree and he just closed his eyes and it was as if for the first time he noticed the silence where the mind moves in the stillness where the body moves in and that stillness and silence is The potential of divinity. Silence is divine potential. Who knew? It's like there has to be some sort of mind presence to even acknowledge the mind. That means whoever you think you are, you're being something, right? And there's an attention there. And this attention looks at the world as if like it's an observer of objects in front of its eyes and it's an observer of subjects behind its eyes yet the eye observer of both the inner realm and the outer realm is attributeless so what does that mean that means regardless of the yin yang symbol echoing imagine every circle in the yin yang symbol was another yin yang symbol and the circles in that was another yin yang symbol and it was this infinite tunnel of yin yang branching out of yin yang symbols you know you would see it's as if all those yin yang symbols would be in one circle The thing is, Daniel, um, I just read your comment in the chat section, you know, it's like the Buddha, he brought up this incredible point that the nature of objective phenomena is empty. So like when that eight-year-old child makes the teddy bear into its best friend, it's like the same way ancient people imbued an idea with life, like the, suddenly the idea of the gods emerge. Do you know the same way that child is imbuing that teddy bear with the personality? And so we can say religion was a very unique artwork <clears throat> in the realm of ideology because it was a sort of personification of the whole of life as an event. So the person looked at the, their neighbors, they looked at uh, everything around them, they looked at themselves in the mirror and it's like, what is moving all this? And so the human mind had found a way, an algorithm at the time, an early 6th century based algorithm where it was as if it's all one. So you see, because we're the small and the big, when we can see, when we look at oneness, we feel equal. We don't feel greater than the world. You don't feel, you don't transcend the world. You just feel equal. But the moment you feel equal, there is no hierarchy. So when your psychology has no hierarchy, it becomes unbound. So when you have an expectation, your psychology becomes bound. Your innovation and intelligence becomes bound. If you treat the mind as a tool that you must mindfully conduct, <laughs> you got to mindfully conduct your mind, that means you notice that the mind is not necessarily an image or an object. It's neither a noun or it's a verb. It's event prior to segmentation of the content of the event. That is the ultimate presence of mind. So what does that mean? That means 
for duality, the singular is like nothingness. It's emptiness. A dualistic creature may never understand oneness. You know, this is us wondering in the future, can, we, can technology become so conscious that it, it feels our love? Like when we, when we love, for example, a, a robot, will that robot hug us back? Or would it be just like uh, just a lifeless machine? Because human beings have hilariously uh, acted artificially intelligent before they've made artificial intelligence. <laughs> Before AI has properly opened its eyes, we have actually acted artificial. And if, if AI becomes image made in the image of man, and man is being artificial, it is being made in the image of the shadow of the inferior visions of the human being. <clears throat> so, out of curiosity... Um, <clears throat> Would the listeners be interested in a Discord session? I mean, do people have enough questions? <laughs> <laughs> you see, you only need to trust a shape. I mean, really, you, you can only trust a say, shape by, to some degree, a accepting and embracing that design. That means it's like an inner decision. Wow, what an incredible concept. I'm going to definitely give a talk on this. Inner decisions and outer decisions. <clears throat> Just to... Keep it alive. The inner decisions are how attention moves before form. Outer decisions is how form moves before attention. Guys, um, I'm going to relocate, and uh, I'll be back in a couple minutes, so treat it as there's going to be a couple minute intermission. It's going to take me a couple minutes. Then uh, I'll set up the Discord event as well.
Okay. So I'm back, guys. Of course, we are the small and the big physically. So we are limited to how far we have been able to see the big. And the big is so big that the more you see it, the less the knowledge is firm. You know, and you look at the word knowledge and you see the word edge at, inside it. And you also see the word ledge. And you imagine you're on the edge of the ledge of your knowing. <laughs> You know, guys, I'm going to go into a quote tunnel, a quote tunnel for those who are new to the channel. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty much me reading a bunch of quotes for, for either a theme or a certain person in history just to see how the inner realms of human beings before us has opened the world to itself. Okay, guys. So this is the quote tunnel. I'm, I'm gonna. It's the. I've chosen the theme time. <clears throat> Baltazar Gracian, Gracian, all that really belongs to us is time. Even he who has nothing else has that. That means when you think you have nothing, at least you have some time. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So nobody's pocket is ever empty. There's time in at that very end of the pocket. Kazi Shams says, no use thinking of the past for it's gone. Don't think of the future because it has to, co it has to come. Think of the present because that's where you are. <clears throat> yeah, but if you don't think about the future, you're not going to open the door, you know. So I understand what he means. So he means um, administer your experience from the present. Bill Keen. Yesterday's the past, tomorrow's the future, but today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. I think Bill Keen could be at the same level of insight as that turtle from the Kung Fu Panda movies. You know. <laughs> William Penn, it's a very nice quote though. T William Penn says, time is what we want most, but we use worse. Wow, time is what we want most, but we use worse. <clears throat> Elizabeth F Forsyth Haley, time is a cruel thief to rob us of our former selves. We, lo we lose as much to life as we do to death. That's an incredible idea. Time is a cruel thief to rob us of our former selves. So that means time is conquering your past. We lose as much as to life as we do to death. Yeah, there's many opportunities. 
But that's why I'm saying that you, when you care, when you wonder about what's important for you that you care about and you go towards that, you get energized. Anything you don't care about and you do, it drains energy from you. Anything you care about that's important to you, you'll suddenly notice your intelligence, your energy levels are totally different. <clears throat> they become uh, hyperized or hyper eyes, you know. <laughs> you get access to hyper eyes, you know. Because how can we see hyper speed without hyper eyes? Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, I'm uh, sorry, I read that. Jeff Mallet, if time flies when you're having fun, it hits the afterburners when you don't think you're having enough. Maria Edgeworth, if we take care of the moments, the years will take care of themselves. Incredible sentence. Well done, Maria. Like, and her name is Edgeworth. That means she found the worth at the edge of her philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible quote, though, I'm going to share it here for people. Guys, this person's last name I can't even pronounce. Theophrastus. Theo Theophrastus. Oh man, like I could totally see. Can you imagine? Like Theophrastus. Can you pass the sock? <laughs> Theo Theophrastus. The guy sounds like a branch of knowledge, you know? <laughs> Time is the most valuable thing a man can spend. Well said. Way to go, Theophrastus. <laughs> Guys, Theophrastus has become, I think, one of the most unique names I've ever heard in my life. Like, I don't think I can ever forget that name. Can you imagine naming your puppy Theophrastus and, like, the name, the, you know... <laughs> you know, they're like, what did you name your puppy? Theophrastus. You know, like, you know, the great. <laughs> oh, man, Theophrastus is, though, he's on, his, his attention is the right place. Time is the most valuable thing a man can spend. That's why strategy is really fascinating to, to the general's mind. Because strategy means you have to um, bring about hope that means even if you don't have here's the thing it's like before victory you need hope of victory so first you got to think of how do i bring the hope then how do i bring the victory you know <clears throat> they're they're like levels you know tennessee williams says time is the longest distance between two places interesting quote lao tzu says time is a created thing to say i don't have time is like saying i don't want to I don't know if Lao Tzu would speak like yeah maybe this is this this seems Taoistic enough, but it it seems also more of a modern problem. I don't know if Lao Tzu would in, talk about time in this way back in the day. But anyways, Philip Philip Stanhope is that a comedian? F Philip Stanhope. Know the true value of time. Snatch, seize, and enjoy every moment of it. No idleness, no laziness, no procrastination. Never put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Definitely not a comedian. 
So he's he's giving a nice, he's sharing, Philip Stanhope is sharing the interesting algorithm in this quote. He says, know the true value of time, snatch, seize, and enjoy every moment of it. This is the street smart that I was blessed enough to see in the busy markets of Iran, in the, in the busy bazaars of Iran. That they were all, all the store owners were trying to snatch the moment the customer would come to one of the stores. Do you know what I mean? The guy would say, hey man, I got something better, want to see? You know, and then it would be like fishing. It was as if like they were all friends, all the store owners in the bazaar, but the moment the customer came, it's like everybody was fighting to get the fish, you know? <laughs> you know, so you got to be careful when you go shopping in, in countries where <clears throat> it's like there's a level of savageness ethically still embraced. Nathaniel Hawthorne, time flies over us but leaves its shadow behind. That's an incredible sentence. Wow. The shadows of time. So incredible I may perhaps speak about it. The shadow of time, but would time have a shadow? No, time is time is is the shadow. Time flies us. So he's saying time flies over us. So time is like the object and it leaves behind the shadow. So actually the shadow is not something in time. The shadow is not the object. So the shadow is dependent on the light behind the object. So Nathaniel Hawthorne is saying time flies over us but leaves its shadow behind. Time is an object of thought where its shadow is how the experiencer looked through that thought. I don't know. This, this one's a complex one, guys. But leaves its shadow behind. I'm gonna I'm gonna share this quote so people, um, if they can, if, if they feel they can uh, decode it, you know, attempt it. So Jason says time is unseeable in the chat section. <clears throat> I would say time is the added dimension. So it's like imagine you going to the same place on two different days and you're like, what's different about it? You know, and you see it's the time is the additional dimension where the difference can be discriminated. Right. So there can even be higher dimensions than time because time is a generated uh, shape upon a changing system. So it's literally time is the interpretation of how things change. If things didn't change, we'll change. We'll be like, are we frozen in time, guys? What do we do? What number do we have to call when we're frozen in time? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> we got to call like Rick or something, you know, <laughs> Rick Sanchez, you know, somebody find Rick Sanchez. <laughs> The moment is, is, is actually, it's like, oh, okay, here. Guys, let me just continue with the quote tunnel. I think the answers will come. Khalil Gibran says, the timeless, the timeless in you is aware of life's timelessness. I thought at first he's going to say the timeless in you is aware of the timeless in me. Yay, we're all every. <laughs> Khalil Gibran, let me honor the full quote. He says, the timeless in you is aware of life's timelessness and knows that yesterday is but today's memory and tomorrow is today's dream. Wow. Khalil Gibran. 
piercing the veils of thought like a master swordsman, you know. Master poet. C.S. Lewis says, the future is something which everyone reaches at the rate of 60 minutes an hour. Whatever he does, whoever he is. John Updike says, suspect each moment for it is a thief tiptoeing away with more than it brings. Yeah. Time is an opportunity. Schopenhauer, philosopher, German philosopher, I believe. The common man, I think Christian philosopher, if I remember correctly. The common man is not concerned about the passage of time. The man of talent is driven, is driven by it. When you see the two things happen, when you notice the hour sands of the hourglass of mortality in this life, you either give in, you are either stopped by it, or you are driven by it. I can tell you that is the, those who have seen the unknown, <clears throat> uh, their eyes walk with a different knowing. He says, again, I'm going to read the quote again, he says, The common man is not concerned about the passage of time. The man of talent is driven by it. That means your mortality is the, your greatest motivational coach. When we notice the candle it will melt, as Romy has said, before death takes away all that is given, give away all there is to give. What does that mean? That means the light of the candle, if it just keeps hidden to itself, there's no value. You gotta let you gotta release your mind on the only world that you know. In in the sense that every day happens once. Charles Dickens, old time. That greatest and longest established spinner of all. His factory is a secret place. His work is noiseless and his hands are mute. Are mutes. Wow. Alan Lacan. Time equals life. Therefore, waste your time and waste of your life. Or master your time and master your life. Sorry, Alan Lacan. Lake, Lake Hine. Charles Richards, don't be fooled by the calendar. There are only as many days in the year as you make use of. Wow. One man gets only a week's value out of a year, while another man gets a full year's value out of a week. This is inspiring. I'm going to share this. That means it's your, your use, you know. So Jason says, hey, Mr. Ruthman, where can I read your sci-fi philosophy or anything? 
so here's the thing guys the sci-fi isn't out yet because um i'm i'm thinking of its display yet that means it's like I gotta meditate on the idea of it more to see how how I feel I should release it. So it's in progress. The, there are, there are two books, two philosophy books that I've written. I mean, they're not per se philosophy, but they're just stuff I wrote. And <clears throat> those are. Let me see if I can find the link for it. I think the link of it should be in the main page. I mean, I think. I mean, I know it should be there. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to read a few more quotes, then end it off and set up the Discord. Wow, this quote is so next level. It says, D Dion Buchikalt. Bu Bu I'm pretty sure I'm butchering the name, but anyways, Dion Buchikalt says, Men talking of killing time while time quietly kills them. Wow. This is a quote of a different class of insight you know because the eyes that don't fear the order can look at the chaos and the eyes that don't fear the chaos can see the order JK Rowling it's a strange thing, but when you're dreading something and would give anything to slow down time, it has a disobliging habit of speeding up. Yeah, when you feel any time there's a sort of fight and flight kind of psychology in the moment, well, that's intense energy. That's turbulence. Domenico Chieri Estrada says, Time is like the wind, it lifts the light and leaves the heavy. Guys, this quote by Domenico if Einstein heard it, he'd be so fascinated. Einstein would be like, No way, this guy. Like he says, time is like the wind. It lifts the light and leaves the heavy. Imagine time was a force that is lifting light. I mean, he doesn't mean it in a scientific sense, but I, I, you know. Napoleon, there is one kind of robber whom the law does not strike at and who steals what is most precious to men, time. Wow, time is the... <clears throat> uh, it's like more many societies saw it as a thief. Carl Sandburg, time is the coin of your life. It is the only coin you have, and only you can determine how it will be spent. Be careful lest you let other people spend it for you. Thomas Jefferson, determined never to be idle. No person will have occasion to complain of the want of time who never loses any. It is wonderful how much can be done if we are always doing. <clears throat> yeah, that's... Uh...
Charles Darwin, a man who dares to waste one hour of life has not discovered the value of life. He's got a point, you know, it's like you're on the roller coaster for a little while. Better get a good look at the view. Last but not least, a quote from Paracelsus. Paracelsus. He says, Time is a brisk wind. For each hour it brings something new. But who can understand and measure its sharp breath, its mystery, and its design? That means he's wondering about the questioner again. <clears throat> so anyways, guys, that's the end of the quote tunnel. Um, time to open the mind of humanity. Just a suggestion that we got to wonder about what is the ability, kind of treat our consciousness as if it suddenly like uh, opened its eyes on an island of manifestation. And there has to be a certain dimension that is trusting civilization, living with it, growing with the unknown factors of your collective and certain levels of life where you got to learn from your own individual unknown and whatnot. You see, Lobo, <clears throat> the moment you see a simulation having one origin, it literally means everything is one thing in another dimension. That means truth is hiding, but why? So guys, um, just help increase the advanced communication of your civilization for the next 30 years before we got to handle digital problems. So we want to update the user of technology. We're treating language like a technology. Anybody who, who, who feels they're defined by language, you know, you are beyond the definition. You were the silence before the word was born. Before the world became words, there was a world. There was a present. There was the sunbeam being the messenger of the sun. That the more you looked at, the less you could see. The inconceivable brightness that the eyes of the lesser, by the defining of their lesserness, they can never see. You see, you, it's like you got to be conscious. I'm telling you the most healthiest way to see the human psychology is everybody's DNA is a unique gift. It's like a unique instrument. <clears throat> like I thought of saying it in, in regards to X-Men powers, but I'm like, okay, maybe that's too, too animating and too much. But, but the best way is to see it in a real way where it's like an instrument, right? And so your intelligence, how it's being instrumented is very crucial how you your attention you notice your attention and not just necessarily just a you certain relationship with the, the content in your attention then there is the era of advanced communication that's when communication becomes a gift when we realize behind our eyes there is a freedom that can revolutionize what's in front of our eyes so anyways guys thanks for listening so far the talk component of this video has ended but I'm going to share a discord link in case anybody wants to has a question and wants to be in a voice chat kind of philosophical school of Athens like environment